Hello there. Um, today I'm going to revise a paper in physics, um, a 2020 paper uh, for one of the classes I'd given some time back, that was last year. I'm uh, going to do quote section A and section B will follow. Remember to subscribe and leave your comments below. So question one, how many millimeters are in 22.5 centimeters? Okay, you should notice say one centimeter is equal to uh, 10 millimeters. So my answer there comes out as 225 because um, you have to multiply the centimeter magnitude by 10, giving me that. Or we'll make this relationship here. One centimeter is to 10 millimeters. Therefore, 22.5 centimeters is to X. When you cross multiply, your answer is this. Therefore, our answer is A. Number two, what is the reading on the micrometer screw gauge below? Therefore, the main scale reading, then you've got the micro scale reading. On the main scale reading here, there is no number, but you can tell to say this division here is longer. So this is our 5. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.75, because the below marking here means uh, uh, another division. So this is 0 0.75. This is my main scale reading, is 0 0.75. Then the micro scale is... 0 0.28 millimeters therefore these values on the micro scale are read as 0 point something therefore the zero, this is 0 0.30 this is 0 0.25 and uh, where this therefore this is 0 0.25 0 0.26 0 0.27 0 0.28 the mark on the micro scale in line with this line on the main scale therefore this is 0 0.28 which is this here when you add the two your answer comes at as um 1.03 millimeters that's our answer there c Question C, I mean question 3, um, what is the difference between two measurements of the same object with values of 3.4 and 3.42? The difference there is accuracy. This value here is more accurate than this one. So accuracy is the difference. This one is more detailed. It's giving you more uh, information about the degree or magnitude of the measurement. And then number 5, calculate the resultant force in the figure below. The resultant force is also known as the net force or the unbalanced force and the resultant force is the force that brings about acceleration okay acceleration therefore from the two gentlemen pulling each other here uh this one is using 20 newtons the other one is using 10 newtons you can even tell from this one who's bending to say he's almost being overcome because the force being produced by this one is higher so the unbalanced force between the two is a 10 because this one is pulling uh with a 20 which is which is greater than this new, this force by 10. So the way you find the resultant force is by using this simple relation here. Resultant force is equal to force minus opposing force. Okay, meaning our action force is our 20, our reaction force is a 10 because it's a smaller one. Therefore, when you subtract the two, your answer will come out as 10. This is the force which will be unbalanced, our net force, the force which is going to cause this person to be pulled. Next uh, uh, question there, what is the average velocity of a car traveling um, or that travels 400 meters in three uh, minutes? Our, velo our formula is this, average velocity is equal to distance over time. Therefore, it's going to be distance 400 over this three has to be converted to seconds. Therefore, three times skisti gives me 180 seconds. Therefore, 400 over 180 gives me this value here that would be our average velocity number seven which one of the following is not an SI unit our answer is degree Celsius meters per second watt and Newton are all SI units but they are not base units they are derived uh, units therefore their derivations from SI units but this one here is not an SI unit because the the unit for temperature the SI unit for temperature is Kelvin so our answer here is B Number eight has no diagram. I left out the drag diagram, so it doesn't, it won't really help us in any way. So I'll skip number eight. We we'll go to question nine. So I go to question nine, number eight. I forgot the, the diagram, so I actually skipped this when I was marking. I realized I didn't insert the diagram. So number nine, which substance does not contract if cooled from two to zero degrees? That's pure water. There are normally or the abnormal expansion of water below four degrees. All liquids tend to contract up to the point of freezing, up to their freezing points. But for water, it tends to contract up to four degrees. 
and after four degrees it begins to expand due to the formation or the extension of hydrogen bonds the formation of extended hydrogen bonds therefore by the time it begins to expand at zero degrees that's the time when it begins to freeze it will have these extended hydrogen bonds which cause ice to be less dense which cause the ice the water molecules in ice to be spaced more than the water molecules in liquid and ice is actually less dense than liquid water so the answer there is B. Number 10, the diagram below shows the displacement time graph for a transverse wave. That's our displacement time graph. Displacement on the Y, then the wave is on the, this is time. Um, the question is, how long does it take to make 2.5 waves? When you read this, you can tell to say there are actually 2.5 waves there. They are passing however they are passing. And uh, from this, uh, you can tell to say one crest and one trough is one cycle or one wave another crest and the trough that's one wave well, that's one wave making it two waves then a crest without a trough gives you half a wave and uh, the, the 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 ending point here is on the 2.5th um, mark in time therefore uh, it takes 2.5 seconds to produce 2.5 cycles our answer here is d number 11 which of the following circuits containing uh, identical resistors will give the highest current my answer here is a and you can prove this by putting the same type of resistors if i put a two there and a two there i put a two here and a two here you'll find that um um and so the current is higher where there's less resistance so if I put twos everywhere here, my lowest value is going to be in A. If I put two there, two there, two there, uh, at the end of it all, oh, this is going to be a three, and that will be a two. I mean, this is going to be a four, that will be a two. But if I put a two and a two there, this is going to be a two and a two there, but the whole thing here is that um, the lowest value of resistance is going to come out here. You have to practice it, okay, by putting the same type of resistor values and calculate the effective resistance, and the answer should come out as A. Unless otherwise, so number 12, the transformer used to find electric power is, I mean the formula, sorry, the formula used to find electric power is A, power is equal to VI or IV, that's a the formula. Then number 13, the figure below or below is a current carrying wire in a magnetic field. Which arrows show the direction of uh, uh, force on the wire? Which arrows show the direction of, the, this is all about the motor effect. Current is moving in that direction, and if you're talking about the motor effect, you are about to talk about, or we are talking about the the we, we can only determine the force direction of force by using Fleming's left hand rule, Fleming's left hand rule, or the motor rule. Therefore, the motor rule comes to us like this, where the thumb shows the direction of force, the first finger shows the direction of magne, uh, magnetism, then the middle finger shows the direction of um, the, 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 the current. So you align your fingers. Uh, magnetic field lines run from north to south, therefore I'll point to the south because they head south. Then the current is in that direction. Okay, in that direction. Then the force will be up to upwards. The force is going to be upwards. So make sure you align the fingers accordingly, then you're going to get the direction of force uh, accordingly. Okay, so my direction there is going to be B, which is going to be upwards. Question 14, the diagram below shows a magnet moving into a solenoid. Uh, which of the following is true? My answer there is A. Um, if arrow is south pole, the induced current flows in the direction of the arrow M. That is very true because if this is south uh, and it is the one approaching the solenoid, then U is going to be south as well. Therefore, an approaching magnet like this one causes or brings about or induces a magnetic field even in the solenoid. And apart from the inducing the magnetic field, it also induces a current in the solenoid. So when S, that is south, is approaching, this will also be south. Okay, and if this is south, then the other one will be south. In this case, for us to know the direction of current, we have to use the right hand grip, okay, on a solenoid. My right hand grip is going to be something like that. Okay, therefore my fingers show the direction of current then the thumb shows the direction of the north or this it points in the north therefore this will be my north and then my fingers meaning the direction of current in the solenoid is going to be upwards like that so current is going to go behind there then come down like that and move in the direction of m 
okay and the galvanometer is actually deflecting in the direction of current like that so my answer there is a number 15 a transformer is used to convert 240 volts to 12 volts is a step up step down transformer to um to power a table lamp if the current in the primary is 0.2 amps what is the current in the secondary coil take transformer to be ideal therefore take the transformer to be 100 percent efficient i use my transformer equation here this is a complete version of the transformer equation but i can simply use it in parts like you know i i remove the the coils, the numbers of coils, because what is, what is concerned here is just the voltage and current. So I use only that part remaining of the transformer equation, and my answer comes out as uh, 4 amps. That would be the current in the secondary coil, 4 amperes. Number 16, which part of the CRO, the cathode ray oscilloscope, helps the um, emitted electrons to come together and form a fine beam? Therefore, coming together and forming a fine beam is... I would say, in other words, focusing the electrons or focusing the cathode rays. Uh, my answer there is the anode or the anode. Therefore, the anode has got two functions, to focus the cathode rays or focus the electrons and also to accelerate them, to accelerate them. Uh, question 17, the diagram below shows the structure of an atom of carbon. Uh, that's our key, electron, neutron, proton. Um, the question follows, what is the nuclide notation of this atom? What is the nuclide notation of this atom? Nuclide notation is simply uh, writing a chemical formula of an element like the way it appears on the periodic table, where you have the mass and the atomic number, like the way these are. This is a mass, then atomic number, and that is actually our, our answer, excuse me. So the mass here is coming from the nucleons themselves, H neutrons six protons when you add these they give you 14 then um electrons that's one two three four five six although i'm just confirming there to show that the number of protons in this atom is equal to the number of electrons meaning that the atom is electrically neutral but all in all the answer is this here that's the nuclide notation of this atom we get to question 18 Okay, apparently there's no question 18 and this gets to section B. I'll post this video in the next one so they don't really get too long. Um, I'll see you in the next video and thanks for watching. Uh, remember to look out for the next video for section B. This paper is nice. Bye-bye for now.